Welcome to the Between Two Wheels podcast, where we talk about all things on and between two wheels. I'm your host, Johnny, wearer of Jorts Roadblock, and you all know my co-hosts, Justin, Coke Can, Bird, and Uncle. I'm not actually on this episode, Ken. This episode is being brought to you by Get Lowered Cycles, your one-stop shop for all things Harley and Harley related, and Nutsack, the last EDC bag you will ever want or need. Today, we are sitting down with Chris Moose of Moosecraft here in the studio with us live. What's well, going on? Not actually live. What's well, live right now? It's recording though. Well, as we were no one is live. hearing this right now. At the moment, we are live. Yeah. We are in the past for <laughs> you, the person, the listener, the person that's hearing this right now. I've had too long of a week. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody so, has the same length week. I don't know where you come from. <laughs> yeah, it's all seven days. Yeah. Much. So what's going on, guys? Uh, just, you know, here in here. the past. In the past. Present. There you go. <laughs> Present in the past. All right. All right. So with only six years in the motorcycle industry. Only. Only. Yeah. 2012. 13. Yeah. Okay. Six. <laughs> I can count. There you go. You have definitely made your mark on the motorcycle scene. So from placing in prestigious bike shows uh, such as IMS to being featured on Discovery Channel's Biker Live. I mean, you've done a lot. <laughs> in a very short amount of time. I just migrated directly over from Hot Rods that I've been messing around with for over 20 years. So yeah, motorcycles are easy. They take up less real estate. You can make more or equal margins and less square footage exactly <laughs> that's when people said like why did you stop you know messing with cars i'm like smaller space easier to work on cheaper one motor one motorcycle yeah one pallet rack yeah, one car five pallet racks there you go <laughs> <laughs> so let's kind of do some get to know you questions here where are you from my mother and father that's that's good that's good. Specifically the JJ region? Yeah. I mean, I was started yeah. off with my father, and I ended up my mother. I popped out of Presbyterian in Dallas. Okay. Okay, I reside, so. I reside the majority of the duration of my life in North Texas, Dallas area. Okay. Okay. So Dallas born and bred. Yeah. Sweet. Um, what got you into motorcycles, specifically riding them or tinkering with them, things like that? So I was working doing a bunch of work for a shelter manufacturing company we were doing nuclear biological chemical fallout shelters mm -hmm. and i was looking to get out of that industry and back into hot rods full-time so i did that on the side still mm -hmm. and i had somebody who was just being a drama baby fest online and they fired somebody and i was like they need a fabricator of course i'll come help you <laughs> <laughs> Damn. i was like yeah i knew i could make this one comment on facebook and instagram to them and they'd call me so I did, and I went and helped them uh, build a vehicle for SEMA that year. Mm -hmm. It was like a 700 horsepower LS7 C6 narrowed front end, full cage, full chassis car uh, nice. Camaro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, in the midst of that being finished, I was in the middle of a custody battle for my kids. My ex was in a really bad place in her life, and I just needed to get away, have my kids get away from her the people that I was working with were involved in the same things. Mm. And so in the process of being involved with that hot rod shop across the street was this guy who had a mill, a lathe, a tubing bender, and we became really good friends real quick because I needed his tools. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great way to make a friendship right there. <laughs> but at the same time, he didn't know anything about shaping sheet metal, so he needed my help. And so there was a good balance of assistance back and forth. And at the end of the project, or the Camaro project, he was like, hey, I'd really like to get your help on this project. And I said, yeah, well, I'm in. I'll help <laughs> you. And from that, we worked on this bike. He asked me to cut the neck on this 30-inch big wheel bagger. And, I mean, I never said, oh, I'm going to go build big wheel baggers and <laughs> motorcycles. Like, no one's ever said that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, people do. And I, I don't have any problem with it. I mean, I, I know what it's like to put a truck on the ground on 24s, 26s, 28s. Yeah. So... I said that I would give him some help on a few things, and I was looking at the way we cut this neck on this 30-inch bike, and I was like, this is dumb. <laughs> I was like, why do we do this this way? And he goes, oh, I mean, we just just what we do. I was like, I'm a math nerd. I draw in CAD. I, everything is on the computer. And he goes, well, that's just where we put it. And I was like, okay, so it works? And he goes, yeah. Well, it rode like crap. Mm -hmm. 
it was so high that this five foot six guy couldn't see over his 2013 Rogue Glide fairing. <laughs> and it made no sense to me because I know what it's like to put a big wheel in a tight space. So I, I literally, I asked him, I said, is there any way we could just like take a bunch of stuff apart, measure some things I could like come up with something better? And he said, yeah, I mean, do whatever you want on your own time. But like, you know, we don't have time for stuff like yeah. that. It's like, cool. So I kind of measured all the internal. I've never taken forks apart at that point. So I'm like, I took forks apart. I measured the whole frame. I measured a stock Harley, measured the wheelbase, all this stuff, looked at the math. And I was like, hey, we could do this. Mm. And it was the short neck for Misfit. And I was like, you know, I only knew a little bit about what I was doing. Like, I barely understood what the hell triple trees were. And I just know parts and math and you know some offset and so with a little bit of assistance from the guys over at american suspension and him and myself we all kind of put together this thing that became the misfit short neck okay that was within like the first couple of months being in the motorcycle industry (laughs) well there you go i just said hey this is a better way to do it and it it became one of our keystone products yeah when you did that was was all the math you said you mentioned you you measured the stock Harley. Was it all about ratios and angles to get things back close to stock or? It was all about trail. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I understand trail a hundred percent because I mean, that just caster, Yeah. you know, and, um, having built like, uh, I've done a bunch of like mid engine rock crawlers and off road race vehicles and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I totally understand suspension. Yeah. And, um, you know, looked at the stock trail on the bike and I said, I'm going to go back to that. And Makes so sense, yeah. even for a 20, like a 26 inch wheel, it was a uh, eight degree neck and four degree trees or four degree neck and eight degree trees. Wow. And then it was an eight degree neck and 10 degree trees on a 30. And so both of those were stock trail with a 26 or a 30. And it looks like part of the bike. It doesn't look like an add on piece. Yeah. You know, integral built wire chase so that you could put all your connectors all the way through the neck and not have to deep in anything bunch of people out there that don't understand how to take pictures and write shit down <laughs> so and they're done that <laughs> yeah. only a lot yep it, it started with that i mean it was just one of those by chance introductions where i just had a guy that was near us that was working on motorcycles i was like yeah that's kind of cool and i needed somewhere to go for work and i i wanted to be proximal to the hot rod shop that mm-hmm. i was leaving because i helped build a lot of projects for them and i didn't want them to have a question like a year down the road or six months and go like hey, what happened to this and how did this happen? I just want to be around to be friendly and be assistive to them. Kind of like a customer service for your previous employer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I never feel like leaving anybody hanging on stuff like that. Sure, you know, sure. But it was, a, it was a great introduction and him and I built the 6 CBO. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's the copper bike, all handmade steel. It's like the first bagger I build is full handmade steel fender with CBO lights molded in with like wire edging and it's ridiculous steel, steel <laughs> side cover steel stretch tank aluminum stretch dash cbo dash um the guy's real short so the seat's real narrow the tank's real narrow at the back and uh that bike like all the copper mesh that's on it, it's all x and y so like all around the bike has <laughs> all that mesh completely matched up by lineage and Jeez. all the hardware got changed out on the whole bike and i'm like looking at some of the hardware and i'm like hey we need to change this bolt and this bolt and this bolt and chris is like why I'm like, trust me, because it, that's what we do with hot rods. I mean, yeah, motorcycle industry is like 10 years behind the hot rod industry. Yeah. So. So why do you think that is? Uh, just supply and demand. I mean, people can't get past the affliction boundary. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Creed. Blame yeah. it on Creed. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's it's been that way for a long time. And I don't really know why it exists that way, but it's very true to standard. I mean, guys that cross over in the hot rod and motorcycle industry see it a lot. Mm. I remember in 2000, I guess it was 2003, late 2013, I talked about wanting to take one of the bikes that we had and do it all panelled and flaked. It's like low rider stuff, the shit. Mm-hmm. It's like long term heritage. Everybody's into it. It's not going anywhere. And now it's so overdone. It's overdone now. <laughs> yeah. Like, I can't stand it. <laughs> he was, Chris said, oh, there's pe- people won't buy that moose. Nobody's into that. It's like, okay. All right. We won't do it then. <laughs> Screw it. So do you currently ride? Oh, yeah. What kind of bike do you have right now that you ride? The riding, you, the riding one? Yeah. Or the two that don't ride? <laughs> <laughs> What's your daily rider? Uh, 2018 Moosecraft I Not. So basically it's a uh, handmade frame. That I built from scratch 
um, somebody asked me when I first started, I was like, hey, where's your frame at? I was pointed at the steel rack. I was like, that piece of pipe, that plate. <laughs> <laughs> that bike's actually mentioned later in the episode. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, um, so it's a 26-inch FLH front suspension and wheel. Um, I've got nest lowers on it, uh, my triple trees. Uh, the wheels are copper plated, or excuse me, brass plated, and then oxidized look like cabinet hardware. Oh, that's so it's cool. Like antique brass, which I've never seen on anything. Um, gas tank is a '76 RD200 Yamaha gas tank. It's got a Sportster pump in it. The motor is the 103 out of my not riding 2012 Road King, because <laughs> I really just started this build with the motor out of the Road King and a $500 transmission off Craigslist and like a $50 wiring harness I bought. Nice. Everything else I that, just got. Those years, the the transmission was a few years older, wasn't it? Uh, the transmission. No, the transmission is a 2006, 2006 Dyna. Yeah. And I noticed that when I was going through the stats that the, yeah. the years didn't match up. I'm like, oh, okay. 2006 <laughs> Dyna, it's a six-speed. Yeah. And then the motor's 2012 Road King. And then the motor, I had Revolution Performance do the work on it for me. So it's a dark horse welded balance crank, 117 big board kit, 1cc dome piston, 657 Drago cams, uh, SNS cam chest package, stage 3 CNC ported heads, stuff. <laughs> like it's got everything you can put in the motor to 117 makes about 140 horse nice bike weighs about 500 pounds jesus <laughs> that's <laughs> dumb <laughs> the uh you know dyna has got all the electrical and stuff like that in the like behind the engine above the training none of that exists on my bike so it's yeah. inside the seat area in the tail section okay it's, it's a two up seat and um the insert in the seat is cnc stitched and mirror form to match the gas tank pattern which is the original rd200 paint job scheme but oh really yeah so everything's done to resemble the original paint scheme that was on the rd200 tank huh i kept it that way because i just really liked the pattern i think it looked cool oh, okay. yeah yeah that was the, you mentioned the the electric that was actually because i i knew about this bike before i knew about you by about a year <laughs> and because we saw it at the original ims that we went to and i, I remember i was just like you know, drooling over this bike. I was like, where the fuck are all the electronics at? <laughs> and then a year later, once again, an IMS is when we, we meet you. And then that's when you're able to explain it to me and, and show me. And granted, I was pretty intoxicated at that point, but it was yeah. still, <laughs> it, I remember most it was still evening. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was great. I was sober the entire time. Uh, you, you always are. <laughs> Cause you guys get like drunk. Wet blanket over here. <laughs> I like to refer to that night as the great wheel strike. <laughs> That was I can't remember one of the guys from West Texas, East Texas, the 2019 Road Glide, brand new freaking bike or A18 Road Glide, whatever. Mm -hmm. We left Strokers and he hit a pothole. He rode a flat eight oh, miles geez. from Strokers to downtown, keeping up with us mad dogging down the highway, doing like 85 and 100 miles an hour. Wow! And then we get to the parking lot and he's like, "Yeah, my air pump won't air up my tire." I was like, "Well, let's look at it." Dude, I could stick my finger in the bead and go <laughs> and let air out. So I'm like walking wow. up and down Deep Ellum looking for a receiver hitch in some back of someone's truck, like stuck in with not a lock on it. Yeah. Nobody down there's got a freaking receiver <laughs> hitch. <laughs> I'm like, that's a hammer. If that's the hammer yeah. we have to have. And then somebody comes back from 7 Eleven and is like, they got a hammer at 7 Eleven. I was like, what the hell do they have a hammer at 7 Eleven for? And he goes, to beat the homeless? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is Deep Ellum. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what was your first bike, your first motorcycle? Uh, the 2012 Road King that doesn't ride. Okay. Yeah, my other bike is a uh, 99 FXR3 that I just recently traded the 06 Dyna that I had. What, nice. are, the, what are the plans for that? The the FXR? I, it's like top secret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I figured out that. It's, it's, it's really deep and dumb. It'll just be a yeah. fun rider, man, honestly. Um, nothing exotic. It, I bought that. I didn't buy that. I actually... I bought a truck for twenty five hundred bucks that I sold for five thousand. That I used the five thousand to get my 06 Dyna. That really only had fifteen hundred dollars worth of actual cash into my accessories mm -hmm. on it. So it was like a Dyna Bro starter pack. You yeah. Know, full legend suspension, handlebars, no T bars. I run short bars on everything. Some tall. Um, you know, lay down license plate, all that seat yeah. stuff. And the guys had an ad on Craigslist says looking for a, and it was my bike. I was like. Yeah, he's like, want to trade 99 FXR <laughs> with 9,000 miles on it. And I was like, and it's completely stock. <laughs> Damn. I sold $3,800 of the parts off of it when I got it. So it's Jeez. just sitting there as a motor frame transmission. Wiring wow. Right. But the, the 2012 Road King, that was my first bike. Um, 
second bike I ever rode. Nice. Because the first bike I rode was Element 13, the aluminum bike that we built on Discovery Channel. Okay. Um, I mean, not everybody gets to go ride a $300,000 bike for the first time to go ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrifying. But we, um, I, everybody already knew me from Discovery Channel and all those other things that we were doing at the Harley dealer. And I just got real tired when I was with Misfit. Um, Chris didn't want me to freaking ride any of the bikes. It was, it just made me cooler than him or something. And <laughs> I didn't care, man. Like I really wanted this bonding experience. I remember being at Sturgis 2000, it was 2013. It was the first year we were there. And I said, man, I said, we're going to go ride. And he says, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. And so he does all the cool bro stuff, ride with all his buddies and back and forth. And he's gone for a day here and there. And at the end of the rally, you know, we're in a semi, so we have to stay later and everybody else to get out. I said, man, we're going to go ride today. And he goes, I got to go pay our taxes. I'll be back. He comes back and he just leaves the bike there and he goes, well, go, go ahead and take off. I was like, I don't know if I can ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, maybe we can go together. <laughs> I was like, it's a bonding thing. And he goes, man, I want to ride. I was like, okay, wow. because you rode the whole time. It's yeah. us. <laughs> and so we came back, built a bike for, still hadn't really ridden at that point. Already had patents on products in the industry relative to suspension motorcycles that had kind of pushed parts of the industry which was fun and then um we went to hot bike tour and man i had nothing to ride again <laughs> the next year came around it was like went to sturgis and it was that shit show again and i was like fuck this <laughs> and i i called like on the way back from sturgis i called the harley dealer in allen out there in north texas and mm -hmm. i said hey i need a 2009 or newer road king basic ass bitch whatever you got low miles 2012 Shrine of Road King, mm, 12,000 miles on it, $12,000. And it was only like two years old. Nice. Still had blue on the white walls. Like the dude never wiped them off or just put new tires on it or something. Mm. But it's like Jonathan's truck. I go up there and it's all stock hand controls, <laughs> stock everything. And I'm looking at it. It's like stuck in a pack. I said, so uh, you started for me? And the guy goes, what, what do you mean? He's like, I don't know how to start this thing. <laughs> it's like stock bike. <laughs> I, all our shit's got push buttons on it. Yeah. Work controls. I'm like, so what do you do? <laughs> like I never started with the stock Jeez. bike. They were already kind of already modified or tore down at that point. I've only been doing it for like a year and a half, two years at that point. Right. And uh, the first time I rode, rode a bike was then actually, because <laughs> I, I had really ridden in the middle of the desert in Palm Springs. And so here I am rush hour traffic on 75 in Dallas, basically. Mm. And he's laughing at me. He's like, "You, what do you mean? He slaps me on the back. And I was like, no, dude, I've never really ridden before. <laughs> and so I put my helmet, already had a helmet, put my helmet on, put my shit on, got on the highway, rode it down the highway in rush hour traffic, first time out. And I was like, yeah, this is a blast, dude. Changed my yeah. life. Like that, that freaking 30 minute ride to the shop changed my life. I was like, I believe dude, it. this is me for the rest of my life. Dallas rush hour. You learn your clutch real well. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, no, you know I, exactly where that friction zone is. I knew where, how to split lanes the first five seconds I was in traffic. <laughs> uh, so what are your thoughts on how the industry? So particularly Harley and Indian um, is evolving kind of the pros and cons around that. Well, I think that uh, Harley Davidson is doing kind of a maintenance route right now. Mm. They're on this plateau of where are we going, and hopefully, this new thing that we're doing is going to mean something. Um, With the Pan America, the Street mm, Fighter, yeah. that platform, yeah. And I, I think the new motor it looks super awesome. Like I just, I'm that guy. I see a motor and a transmission. I'm like, I got a bike. Yeah. <laughs> like, or, or I buy a bike, and I'm like, all I want is the engine and transmission. You yeah. know, like I don't give a shit about anything else. Right. But um. I think that they're on this maintenance loop right now to find out where the gestation period ends and then where the attention begins. So they're not, I don't, I don't feel like they're doing the right kind of marketing though, when it comes to the culture growth that they used to have right. with what they're doing now compared to Indian, whereas Indians like we're family, we're friends. Hey bros, let's go hang out and race and do shit. Yeah. So I've, I've actually got a, uh, another Indian dark horse chief sitting in the shop right now that I'm developing parts for that when we had built two bikes previously, um, I started designing parts for. So I think that there's something to be said about the future Indian. Is it going to be huge? No. But is it going to be marginally sustainable greater than it was in 2013 and 14? Because I was there when they relaunched Indian in 2013. Mm -hmm. That was the first year I went to Sturgis, and it happened in the parking lot right across from us. 
And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Indians coming back out. And it wasn't anything awesome. Yeah. No. But same shit, different year. But if you look at the growth and their numbers and the growth in the dealerships and how that's increased over the very short period of time to which they've had these motorcycles, that's actually an incredible amount of growth and sustenance. Yep. Do you feel the growth is because of the the closure of victory? Oh, of course. So everyone still wants that the non similar, Harley alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, Victory had some really, I mean, like the breakout or what is it, the 8-Ball or whatever. 8-Ball, yep. Yeah, the 8-Ball was a cool bike. I had a friend, uh, Ricky Grafeo, had a 8-Ball, and we were down in Galveston. He was, like, freaking out because he lost his key. He was like, oh, man, I don't want to start my bike. I was drunk last night and lost my shit. And I was like, it's got one 10-millimeter bolt holding your ignition on, dude. We just <laughs> unbolted it, and I looked at it, and I took the ignition column out of it in, like, two seconds, and then I went inside and I grabbed one of our tent stakes and a grinder, and I ground it off and beat it flat and made it a flat, like, flathead screwdriver key. And I was like, here you go. Bolted it back on his bike. He's like, no, everybody can steal your shit. Yep, there you go. <laughs> no, the, I think that they – I think it was more like a save the Indian move. Hmm. because the, the closing of victory mm -hmm, the name heritage they were like okay indians got this longest yeah. name let's keep something that we can put our money behind and everybody knows that the consolidation was all it was yeah. i mean you're seeing the same motors that they were developing come into mm -hmm. indian anyway so well, it's, it's smart their their contracts with the united states government for polaris and for all the sports entities that are using their their atv utvs those kind of things and you know the vehicles they're using on the, the football fields there's a lot of revenue there. Oh, yeah. Right. And, and that's going to help maintain their effort to want to be a, quote, unquote, dominant force in the motorcycle industry. But I, I, I don't see Harley. I don't see Harley's growth going anywhere right now. Right. Not yeah. The the mentality of the well, all the way up until the mid 2000s and 2010s of all the Harley riders wanting to be Billy Badass a lot of that's going away with our generation, especially with Justin's generation. The tweens? Yeah. <laughs> mm. It's Thank bullshit. You. We bring in another person, and I'm still the youngest and the shortest. Yeah. I can't help it. I'm only two score and two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that, that, that lifestyle is not what Harley can sell anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sons of Anarchy wannabes. They're the 45, 50 year old guys today that no one really cares about because they bought that one bike and, you know, they have kids and all that shit and they can't, they can't live that lifestyle. Right. So you have the millennials and the new millennials that are buying motorcycles. They don't give a shit about the badass attitude. They want something that looks cool, performs correctly. And, and that's, that's not Harley. What Harley's known for? It's definitely not their wheelhouse. No. No, but I think one of the things that where Harley wins in the used by mark, bike market is the fact that you have millennials that don't have a ton of freaking income right now, and they're looking for the easy entry bikes, the Sportsters, the Dynas, the everything that nobody really wants. Right. There's a ton of them out there for nothing. Yeah. And so you know somebody, they can't go buy a brand new bike for ten thousand dollars to fourteen thousand dollars. You know, for some of the smaller metric bikes. They're gonna go spend four, five, six thousand dollars on, you know, a Dyna or a Sportster, and if, if they are fortunate enough to spend that much, otherwise they're gonna be crotch rocket guys. They're gonna get into it for twenty five hundred bucks, buy a broke ass Jixer or God knows what else, and then they're gonna go too fast and kill themselves, and then say, okay, we're done. Yeah. Or it's gonna break down, and that's it for them. And then they ru it ruins them for motorcycling. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's Absolutely. a lot of people that get into that, even in the the custom automotive aftermarket, like air ride suspension and stuff like that. People are like, "Oh, I hear they ride on my truck." I'm like, "Why? Because it leaks and it does this." And that. I was like, "Well, you spent two thousand dollars getting it done. <laughs> you spend real money getting it done. You'll love it." Yeah. I mean, it's it's there's pros and cons to all that. I think that the younger generation just really wants to live and have experiences. Yeah. And so being able to be out there, be on the road, that kind of thing. I think that's where Indian kind of wins because they're selling that. The brand mentality is enjoy life, experience life. Mm -hmm. yep. Just like Coleman Power Sports right now. You know, they're real big into this come have fun pit bike mentality. So there's a bunch of real fun group of racers that run around and do that kind of mayhem. <laughs> I, got, I got hurt last year doing that racing <laughs> at the TT track. <laughs> We were at the Coleman Power Sports Invitational Gambler 500 race at the TT track at Sturgis Buffalo Chip. 
and they had us racing around the TT track over some real vertical ass jumps and then up a diamond plate ramp after going from asphalt to gravel <laughs> to asphalt to gravel to diamond plate ramp like and then ice around a, around a bar head on traffic and then down this diamond plate ramp with a downhill right hand turn back onto gravel so i mean none of us got hurt ever <laughs> <laughs> so it, did anyone actually make it out alive <laughs> yeah that, i've got a really good video the guy that was racing me up the ramp he hits the rail before he gets all the way up and he gets to where he's just hauling ass trying to catch up to me and then he overshoots this 90 degree corner and breaks his ankle on the rail oh, he ouch. finished the race wow i didn't because i ended up low siding the bike on the third lap <laughs> from asphalt to gravel trying to outrun a friend of mine Oof. it happens a little bit of road rash <laughs> no i have the hematoma on my left leg <laughs> that was the size of half a football oh jesus and nice. so like all of the skin on the inside of my left knee and on my shin, it feels like somebody's touching me with a feather all day long. So we haven't seen Justin turn green in a while. Can you go into grave <laughs> detail about that? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't see any definition of my kneecap. I couldn't see any definition of my shin. And like the skin separated from the muscle tissue well enough that all of my nerve endings kind of separated. And when the swelling went back down, there was like baggage. <laughs> and it, 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 it literally took like a couple of weeks you know how you can like gather the skin on your knee and like poke it around like jelly mm -hmm. my whole shin was like that awesome <laughs> it was really gross <laughs> <laughs> oh can't wait to have dinner after this right yeah. mm, <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh change gears a little bit here um what got you into fabrication you were talking about the hot rods and everything uh what got you into that um primarily around the fabrication of hot rods um I mean, I got my start off in mini trucks and sport trucks and stuff like that. I had okay. a bag 99 crew cab dually on 19s. Nice. Long time ago. I've always wanted a bag dually. I have no reason why. It's, it so, serves no purpose. So when, awesome. I, when I was in high school, a buddy of mine wanted to completely piss off all the Jeep heads and lay a Jeep on its oh, frame, a Wrangler yes. on frame. Yeah, I got asked to put 20s on a Jeep a long time ago when 20s first came out, and I was like, you're stupid. No. <laughs> yeah. I was still honored. I'm still honoring the Jeep guys at that point. You know. <laughs> Why? My, well, my first job in the automotive arena full time, like not as a hobbyist out of my garage, was at a place called Custom Jeep in Carrollton. And walking in the door, I literally did not know what I was doing. I was just like, I bagged a couple trucks in my garage and <laughs> tinkered. <clears throat> I mean, what got me started on it was that, um, you know, when I was younger, I had. A lot of fun in extracurricular facilities. I, I get you. And um, my mom used to send me lowrider magazines and stuff. Okay. And so I was like, damn, that's sick, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, walking out of that situation, I was just super, super interested in anything that was moving on four wheels at that point. And I had, uh, you know, build stereos, build whatever. And then I was like, I got a, my first truck. I was like, oh, I'm going to lower it. And then after I lowered it, I realized that you had to do this thing called an alignment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or pump your brakes before you roll away, you know, to make sure they engage fully. I mean, very infantile. But, you know, you start messing around with your car or your truck, and then it just gets more exciting. But, I mean, man, like, back in the day when Moss Garage and Jesse James and all that stuff was out, you know, looking in the magazines, it was like, man, they have all these really cool tools in this big old shop, and they, they do cool stuff. and. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to make things, and I've always made stuff. I've always been handy, like, tearing apart RC cars or, you know, my dad worked construction a bunch, and so, like, I understand what it's like to work a jackhammer and, you know, do stonework and all that stuff. Did so, you ever watch my, um, Junkyard Wars? Yeah. Oh, that, oh, that was awesome. That. Awesome. All the that robot shows and stuff. He watched it when he was five. Yeah, it was like yeah, two about. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize they were still running that show two years ago. <laughs> BattleBots came yeah, back. BattleBots was yeah, the shit. Yeah, I just, uh, I just really, I liked uh, working with my hands. And, just tinkering. Yeah, and and it was really kind of interesting. Is like over the course of the years, you know, I mean, from like ninety nine to two thousand, I, I would say ninety eight actually is when I really started getting involved with like my first time welding. I was in kindergarten in ninety eight. Yeah. Just so um, I mean, if you're yeah, gonna start throwing five. that shit out there, five. <laughs> You were five. <laughs> but the, Three years later, I was in a war zone. <laughs> God. <laughs> Child. Yeah. The, the irony is, is that looking into the, you know, looking to today from then, 
I said I wanted to do all these those things, and I looked up to all those people. And over the course of many years, I became friends with people like George Barris, Gene Winfield, Blackie Jehan, all these people in the hot rodding community that I absolutely admire. Um, became familiar and not friends, but I mean, I, I know Jesse James. I could walk up to him. He knows my name. We look at each other and speak. It's not like, oh, hey, bud. Like, you know, just <laughs> we, we have interchange. Um, but it's funny how now I'm the person to some extent that some other people go, man, that'd be cool to do that. Yeah. And I'm just really grateful to have had this amazing journey through a number of different facilities and shops and work that, that I've always been really dedicated to. It was never a shop hopper. Always stuck around until somebody went out of business or stole from themselves. So we... Um, <laughs> There's a story there. Yeah, no kidding. We, uh, <laughs> I, I just love the opportunity that was given. I mean, even like with Misfit, man, I could not have asked for a better opportunity in the world because here we were funded so well that the first year in business, not in business, but in, in the new form of that business, we had a semi truck. We're rolling out with freaking eight bikes to Sturgis I mean two years in we're on Discovery Channel I got to meet all the people that were relevant in the motorcycle industry I was making parts for the whole industry um, became really close to a bunch of people that I admired in the motorcycle industry as I began to know them and now they're my friends and so to be able to operate what I like to prefer to call in the top 5% of the motorcycle industry mm -hmm. is a blessing I mean, yeah. I just, I've just i been given that opportunity by the path that I've had so because you looked up to these people and they kind of were your role models, if you will, do you see it as it's now your turn to pay it forward and help bring up another group, the next generation of fabricators and bike builders in sort of the same way you were? I, I've done that my whole life, though. Yeah. I mean, every step of the way, every time I've ever learned anything, I've always been really forward to want to teach somebody what I'm doing. Even if it wasn't the right answer, it was just really close to the right answer. <laughs> I just want everybody to be on the same playing field. Yeah. Like I, I don't, I don't need to be elevated above anybody else. I just want everybody to do great quality work that they're going to love and it's going to endure for their customer or themselves or mm -hmm. whoever. Because it sucks to end up in the position where somebody is spending thousands of dollars on something, or ten, you know, saving all their money to get somewhere and then get there and be upset and not like it. And then, yeah. they're, then they're no longer part of the industry. I think it is my place and everybody else's who's a business owner in the motorcycle industry to do everything possible to sustain the industry and help it grow. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't turn to the people that are looking up to me or want to do the same kind of thing and give them the most advice I can, then I'm hurting my potential earning future. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I like the way you worded that because you're talking about having people love their work. It directly ties into what you mentioned earlier about people, you know, either buying the crappy bike or buying the shitty truck or, or buying the truck and putting the shitty parts on it and then not being happy with it. And then they're no longer part of that community. It's, it's funny how it's a direct correlation to the actual art and the actual industry that follows those same principles. And I also want to add that he's not bullshitting when he says he wants to bring people up because I sent him a message saying, hey, I kind of want to dabble in this. And what, a day later, we had a two-hour phone call? Yeah. Literally just walking over what I need to get, what I should be looking at, sending me part numbers, links, I mean, you name it. He even said, like, hey, come to the shop one weekend. I can teach you in a day. I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to take you up on that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you guys should definitely come <laughs> by. I, I love to teach welding, man. Yeah. Like, for me, that's a big thing because that'll make a break. Of, I mean, literally make yeah. a break a project. <laughs> yeah. It was crazy, though, because, like, I, I spoke with you and I also spoke with uh, Brian from 4130 Chassis Works, mm -hmm. and he had the exact same response as you did. Yep. was giving me just gobs of information, inviting me up to his shop, literally, and that's what I've... I've really come to love about this part of the industry, the, the fabrication, the the actual building of yeah. parts or bikes is that it's, I mean, you do still have that, that competition. Like everyone wants to make the best bike, the best parts, but everyone is still trying to help out everyone else. Mm -hmm. Which So it's not about making the best bike for me. It's about doing something that speaks to me and makes me like translates my emotions and how I feel about a particular motorcycle so that the people that are around me have an emotional response that creates something that motivates them to also want to continue to grow what it is I'm already a part of. Well, I think you nailed that with, with Dynod because like I said, 
that really sparked my holy shit. Like it was familiar enough to kind of know what was going on, but it was it had like the hidden electronics, the shit like that, that really made me think like, oh wow, there's actually a lot going on here that I want to learn more about. So the bike has a high low switch and yeah. horn on it too. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely God. DOT legal, <laughs> and it has and it has the passenger's handle DOT regulation yeah. so it has a seat strap on it actually oh, too Jesus. it's also laser etched so <laughs> of course it is. has um, so Crystal who was Canadian and mm -hmm. I'm Moose and so she's like my little distraction and it was Moose and Squirrel is what I put on the seat with little arrows that pointed forward and backwards <laughs> but you know she, she had more motorcycles than me so it was yeah. like yeah. she's never could be on, on the back, back of the seat yeah. once <laughs> so talking about welding Yes. <laughs> Tell us the story about how you God, obtained first your first welder. Oh, yeah. My favorite story. Yeah, no, this is so good. <laughs> and, and like I was telling you, I was like, <clears throat> I really would love to find the guy. Yes. <laughs> like, I gen like, I hope I don't go to jail for this. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think you're well outside the, the statute, statute limitations, limitations are, probably. <laughs> are gone. Yeah. And this, this happened in another country and everything. So yeah, yeah. totally. This, yeah. I was speaking a foreign language. Exactly. Yeah. I just yeah. can't remember. What language I was. Yeah. <laughs> Big Latin or smart ass or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was foreign. Yeah. So I remember getting to a point, I'm, the first truck that I ever bagged, you know, my buddies and I were like, oh, let's go rent a torch. Let's go get a stick welder. And I'm like, that was like, somebody said that shit to me today. I would slap them on the hand <laughs> and then lead them to somebody with a reliable welder and maybe yeah. a plasma cutter. So standing there knowing that I need to advance the principles of my fabrication and welding being the key. I'm like, okay, I need a gas welder because somebody said the same thing to me. They're like, you need a MIG welder. It needs to have gas. This is the way you work. Not a freaking arc welder, not a freaking uh, flux core welder. And he goes, um, I, w I walk into Harbor Freight and I'm looking at the welders and I'm looking and I'm looking, and I'm looking. And this guy comes up to me and he, he's like, Hey, can I help you? And I was like, I don't know, man, I'm just looking at the welders. And he goes, you need a welder today? I was like, yeah, I, I need one, but I'm not, I know what I kind of need, but I'm not really sure that I can get one. He walks away, he comes back later. He's like, hey, man, so uh, you need a welder? And I was like, I, I mean, yeah, but I can't afford it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, this, this is the one that I know I need, but this is the one I can almost afford. And he was like, okay. And then he comes back like a couple seconds later and he's like, no, man, do you need a welder? I said, wink, wink. I said, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, you got a hundred bucks? And I said, yep. He said, meet me outside. And I was like, yep, work truck, ladder rack. And I went outside, and this dude went in the back and pulled a freaking welder, pulled a ticket, walked out the front door with it. I had 20 bucks in my pocket. <laughs> I did not have $100 in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks out to the freaking truck, and he loads it up, and he's sweating. He's like, oh, man, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And I was like, yep, me too. See you later, buddy. <laughs> and he's like, what? And I was like, what are you going to do? Go inside and say, hey, I stole a welder and this dude didn't pay me in the parking lot? <laughs> so you... <laughs> oh, played the player. I love it. You, you stole from a thief. Yeah. Yeah. So two negatives makes a positive, right? That's a mathematical uh, fact. It so... positively influenced my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have the very first thing that I ever welded sitting in my mom's garden. And wow. it is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> like, I won't show you. <laughs> It has a place. It'll stay there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's like, I, I genuinely feel like I've done, I've done so much in my life since then that has changed my perception on so many different things. I mean, just emotionally, physically, like family, all these experiences that I've had, like I've had some really amazing experiences involved in the arenas that I've been in. And if it hadn't been for that one interaction, I don't think I'd be here. You that's know, true. Yeah. Same thing. Like I'm really, really grateful to that guy making that mistake that day. <laughs> and, and if if I could legitimately find him, I, I dude, I do everything in, in my capabilities to make his life amazing. Or just give him a hundred bucks. <laughs> I think there's a lot of interest on that hundred yeah. bucks at this point, <laughs> like twenty plus years. Interest plus inflation. <laughs> I mean, I do know the store that he worked at. I know what year it was approximately. In that foreign country. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not like in America. Bangladesh. <laughs> don't, you don't want to steal from there. <laughs> but you're not going to cut your hands off. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so let's talk about the SpongeBob project. 
Yeah. So we're going from your your first project to your most recent. Yeah, project. I'm totally allowed to discuss this now that it's out. Okay, <laughs> good. good. <laughs> I figured I figured that was the case. Um, what was it like working with two multi million dollar companies? Billion dollar companies. Billion dollars. Yeah. Um, was it better? We're talking about Toyota and Viacom. Right. Yeah. Was it better or worse than the small local guy? project mm, like as far as like deadline delivery total experience kind of overall experience yeah. walk us through a start to fit. It, first it, off tell people what it is it's the same so yeah. uh toyota sienna vans platform that's been out for over 10 years now but um i consider myself a freaking sienna specialist now that i've got so many <laughs> sienna projects that are in my bunkhouse but they came to us about <clears throat> eight and a half weeks ago and they said hey we'd really love to talk to you about this project and i was like okay cool so uh gentleman Sean Freelich over at Complete Customs and I do a lot of cooperative work working with Toyota and I uh, do a lot of fab fabrication rapid prototyping stuff like that for Toyota and for Sean and they said well we're gonna this Spongebob's turning 20 and we want to build this Sienna van out for um, Comic-Con in San Diego in eight weeks and we're like yeah cool we're in so they came to us with three different concepts that were fairly fleshed out mm -hmm. um, and we had to expand upon them in order to find out what they thought was the best creative outlet for that decision. Mm -hmm. And then they honed in on one and then we expanded on that and they loved it and it was everything in the world that we wanted to deliver and then through the process, the, the difference with a big corporate entity like that is you have so many people involved in the process that they don't all communicate. <laughs> And they'll tell you that too. Like I could say this openly and all parties would listen to it and go, oh yeah, we had that issue. Yeah. I was, they waited five weeks to pull the trigger on this project. So three and a half weeks ago, they said, let's go. Oof. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> so I started a flow chart on a four by eight dry erase board in my shop the day that we talked about it. It detailed each one of the vendors that I was gonna use to perform certain tasks in order to execute the project. Basically, the van has SpongeBob's house as the driver's seat. The seat bottom is his sidewalk and front yard. And then the passenger front seat is Squidward's house. The second row is the Krusty Krab. The third row is the Cityscape. The interior 260 pieces were completely disassembled, prepped and painted, airbrushed, faded twice, and clear coated, Jesus. which means they had to come apart, get based get reassembled like the whole dash which is like 60 pieces <clears throat> and then the graphics had to be airbrushed on top of that and then disassembled then clear coated then reassembled yep um and uh the headliner is printed material so it has a graphic image that's printed across the whole piece all of the vinyl for the seat i had a company in um another country that i won't discuss because it's kind of a secret of mine <laughs> print the vinyl and i got a sample from them in like three days originally and you can't degrade the surface. So it's abrasion resistant. It's meant to be furnishing leatherette. Uh, it's a synthetic leather. And in order to degrade the image, you have to break the surface. So tear it, rip it. We did 40 sheets at 50 by 96 printed vinyl. God. And they, are <laughs> this is where shit gets real fun. So everything else is happening. I'm managing the project. I'm trying to get the logistics worked out on this thing, on the vinyl. They kick back our credit card payment the first time we send it over. And they're like, oh, well, you're billing and shipping and addresses and stuff, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, they close at 1130 our time. They're in England. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. So I didn't realize when they hung up that I couldn't call them back because they were closing. The next day we go to process and to payment. We reorganized all the information. I'm like, oh, yeah, everything's good. It went through. Cool. They're going to start the order. We have two weeks before we have to be done. No. They kicked it back after they closed. Next day, PayPal. Okay, ran it. 5 p.m. that next day. Bounced it back. They're like, you're going to have to do a bank transfer. And I'm like, okay, this is a scam. Yeah, yeah. This is a scam. Someone's got a small format printer, and this is not a big scale business. And I'm really freaking out because I've only got one shot at this. And the PayPal thing didn't work. The bank draft thing, they only gave us half the information. We actually had to get a friend of ours who is a bank manager to investigate for us through third parties overseas to identify all the information that we needed in order to do an accurate bank transfer without their information directly. God. Processed it after hours on the 3rd of July. And so they still work on the 4th because, you know, in England they don't set yeah. it by Independence Day. <laughs> we all know why. <laughs> So 
we, um, I call them up and they're like, yeah, well, it's going to take three days for that money to hit. And I'm like, what? Oh I don't have time. Like, I need the fabric this week. We have one week left to del del finish the vehicle and deliver it. So I get a hold of them on Friday. They're like, the payment went through. I'm like, sweet. So I call them and I'm talking to them like five in the morning. They got a half day left. And I said, um, I'll pay another $2,000 for that material to get printed over the weekend and shipped to me by Monday. They said, no, nah, we don't do expedite stuff. I was like, you guys and your system screwed around. It's your fault that it didn't get done. I said, no, 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 it's not. I was like, okay, because here's the order that I placed yesterday with my information and it didn't go through. So they printed it over the course of Monday. In the meantime, I'm trying to get a logistics manager to find it for me and move it from their facility to the airport to here. Not UPS, not FedEx. So I put some information out there, and a buddy of mine, John Oaks, who owns the Four Corners Motorcycle Rally. Oh, I've been talking to that guy recently. John's amazing. He gets me a hold of somebody in England who was the marketing manager for Warner Records originally, I think, hmm. or at one point. Mm -hmm. And so she knows somebody who moves, like, stage equipment and stuff, like, last minute overseas. Yeah. And it's a door-to-door -door service. So they've picked up the material Tuesday. <laughs> And then it got disassembled and unwrapped and reinspected and held for 18 hours because they thought it was drugs. Oh, God. Of course. <laughs> now, mind you, this is Tuesday. The vehicle has to leave the following Monday. Oh, my we God. We still have to sew all those seats. So, finally, Tuesday, or no, Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. it flies. And then it shows up Wednesday night at 9 p.m. here in the U.S., I, at that point, I inspected all the material and then had a phone call with a friend. I said, dude, you got three hours to be on a plane. I need you to fly from Vegas to Dallas. I need you to sit down and sew in somebody else's facility and help us make seats for the next four days. He goes, yeah, cool. Got, it. got on a plane at 8 p.m. that night, flew in at like 2 in the morning. My dad picked him up, brought him straight to the freaking, or flew at 2 in the morning, got here at 6 a.m., my dad brought him straight to the freaking place where he was sewing. He sat there and sewed all day. They did the seats in three days. Jesus. <laughs> it's, they finished on Saturday. We finished the vehicle on Tuesday morning at like 2 or 3 in the morning. I went and took like a two or three hour nap and did my laundry and grabbed my stuff and then drove it all the way to San Diego with our photographer, Dale Martin. And I was up for four days at that point <laughs> and drove it all the way there with him. I slept eight hours and four days. We delivered the vehicle, set up the whole display. They, we had audio. So this thing has audio buttons in it. We did a compute completely isolated electrical system in this thing to where you push buttons and it plays audio bytes. Like the best day ever was supposed to be the horn. Well, it became a button because the horn thing wasn't working. Mm -hmm. The dome lights were plankton making sounds, Patrick, you know, all this stuff. <clears throat> so we isolated all the electrical from those buttons to a completely new electrical system with its own amplifier, with its own power safety system and a shutoff and a big plug and everything and it powered four TVs that played Nintendo Switches with a kart racer game that came out of the front that sat to the right of the vehicle <laughs> all of this in literally two weeks technically because I gutted the van and then it went through all this process um, it didn't play audio the circuit board didn't work it's a real simple audio board mm -hmm. ground pin bink, and it plays well we debuted it and everybody was like oh it doesn't play audio I think it's <laughs> they were just sad. They were really sad because the key was it needed to play this audio. Yeah. And they all went out to dinner, and I'm on my knees behind the van in the back where the seats fold down normally, which is now the electrical compartment. And I'm falling asleep staring at it. And as I have this lucid dream <laughs> after being awake for so many days, I remember seeing this red light come on when an audio bite would play, and then it would go off. And I opened my eyes and I looked at the circuit board and the red lights on and I went to re hit the reset pin and it would go on and off and the speakers would pop mm -hmm. when I would let go of the pin. So it was reverse polarity? No, what was happening is I had two switches that were stuck on at the same time. <laughs> and so I'm sitting over there and I had a bridge between a common and a ground mm -hmm. on the circuit board. And so I scratched that off, which was part of my connection. And then the second, and I was like, oh, that didn't fix it. <laughs> And then I started taking wires off, and I found out that four of my switches didn't work. Took them off, and it was like 9 p.m. that night, and I freaking sent 
George, the lead director for Nickelodeon, a video of it at nine at night. And I was like, how about them apples? He goes, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody came the next day and they're like, yeah, it's awesome. It works. And I was like, I was fucking with you the whole time. It always worked. <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> you've so, never been so happy to hear spongebob's laugh <laughs> i screamed across the park oh i could imagine off, dude. dude and the people that were setting up the rainbow butterfly unicorn kitty right next to me they were like what the fuck is going on <laughs> and they like they ran over and they're like are you okay and i was like no it's really okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> but no i mean like clients like that are are they're very demanding um because they they think they know how things should happen mm -hmm. they want to see a lot of progress which i'm not into progress i'm into surprises like yeah. I want, I want to just deliver a project and have this impact because there's this, um, there's this energy that you have when you deliver something, but if you see it all the way through the process, you're stealing its soul. Yep. Like you're stealing little pieces of its soul every time you deliver this progress pick. Yeah. And so when you give it to somebody, there's not this general surprise and they don't get to find all the little secrets. Mm -hmm. Instead, they know all of them already. Yeah. Sure. You know, so all the Easter eggs. Yeah. And, yep. and for me, it's one of those things where. I value that work the same as I do a guy spending 20 bucks. Like you come to my shop and you're like, Hey man, I broke this and I need you to weld it. Like I'm going to treat you with the same respect as a client that's spending a hundred thousand dollars because everybody has a need and there's no reason why one should be more valuable than the other. Oh, cool. Cool. Okay. So let's, uh, let's take a break here from our sponsor nutsack. And when, when we return, we'll go over the uh, final half of the uh, interview. Nutsack is the only EDC bag the crew carries, and for good reason. They're crazy and awesome. They get their name because folks said they had to be nuts to manufacture a man bag in America with American waxed canvas, American leather, and American labor. We want you to join us in the two-week challenge. Buy a bag from them, use it for two weeks, and if it doesn't completely change the way you carry your everyday gear, they will give you a full refund. We absolutely love ours from carrying a around extra mags for our concealed carry to earbuds, sunglasses, vape stuff, and business cards. It is great having less shit in our pockets, and it was because of the nutsack satchels that we were able to be less weighed down. If you buy using our link, Nutsack will give you $5 off to enjoy a beer. Head over to nutsack.com slash B2W. That's N-U-T-S-A-C dot com slash be the number two w to get yours today and we are back so justin let's have you lead this this half i don't wanna you wrote it exactly i've already done my part <laughs> <laughs> all right so um what is your current involvement with uh the it was is a charity organization well yep. it, it's a 501c3 motorcycle okay. missions uh, motorcycle missions tell mm -hmm. us tell us kind of a little bit about it and your current involvement with it um crystal hess out of austin texas is the founder of motorcycle missions 501c3 can be found on uh that whole shop amazon thing so all you guys get on there and you know like maybe contribute or to these guys if they got one too <laughs> but um we, we don't but bike and bird does <laughs> yeah um no it's an amazing thing uh so motorcycle missions does um motorcycle build mentorship and motocross training camps for veterans and first responders that suffer from PTSD, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, etc. It is a way to find a common bond and a common objective to create a communal bond so that everybody feels like they have a place and a duty and a job or a brotherhood. It's <clears throat> it's community building and it's camaraderie and motorcycles happen. Yeah. It, it's not about the motorcycle, it's about the people. Yeah. Those are just a byproduct. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's an amazing thing. I've been really blessed to be a part of it. Um, there's been some very significant bikes that I've been allowed to be a part of creating. And uh, currently we have, I, I should say she has, um, two motorcycles that were built for Indian Motorcycle uh, that were donated and are being auctioned off at the Deadwood Lodge. Um, by the time this comes out, it'll probably be when the auction is occurring because you guys are like a week or two. Yeah, this one will yep. come out in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So August 5th, I believe, or August 3rd is the uh, auction. But um, a lot of great blessings to be a part of the mentorship program. And so uh, teach welding, host builds in the shop, those kind of things. Um, a lot of what Motorcycle Missions has done lately is diversify its reach by finding other shops and communities to be a part of. They currently have a Fuel Cleveland build, which is happening as we speak, uh, the debut and the show. 
And then there's going to be one for Arizona Bike Week next year through Buddy Sub Charlie Davidson. There's one in Dofo. Oh, they do good work. Mm-hmm. Uh, Danny's a good friend of mine. Dude's that was awesome. my favorite pick for the yeah. Battle of the Kings. I saw that. Yeah. Um, I saw that before anybody else no, saw I'm that, sure actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, they've got a build in Dofo Winery in Southern California, which is awesome. And so uh, Motorcycle Missions is moving to diversify its yeah. outreach by landing themselves within other communities so that they're broadened reach, which is amazing. So where I can and when I can, um, we don't currently do any more builds out of my facility because mm-hmm. I've got some major obligations to Toyota client. But, uh, and then, you know, working on developing parts for a new motorcycle. So uh, where I fit in, I'm going to continue to do support as far as they got to build at a uh, Paris Harley Davidson actually right now. Oh, so yeah. the Road King with the Liberty side cars being done up there for the Bring It Home ride, which we will all be at. Yes. Um, looking forward to you guys coming up. I'm going to find a way so to jump on with you and ride up <laughs> because the guys that are the guys that are in my area, they're going to be a part of that. Um, I'm going to try to get them to come on the ride together with you guys to yeah. ride up to Paris, which is only like two and a half hours from me. So. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, that that'll be our last stop, I, I believe, is that North Dallas location. The uh, Allen, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be in Allen. So I'm in Denton. Which so Corinth, which is American Eagle, Harley Davidson, Maverick Harley Davidson, case Carrollton, which is kind of like my neck of the woods. But uh, we'll shoot over and catch you guys, yeah. and then that'll be like another hour and a half jump up from That'd there. Be awesome, sweet. You guys are gonna miss the good ride on the way up by going straight up seventy five, though. Just saying. Well, at that point, we'd be riding for, not riding for that long. We've but... been up <laughs> and and herding kittens for yeah. about twelve to thirteen hours by that point. Yeah, pussies. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just talked about being up for four days. Yeah. And <laughs> we're like, oh, we're going to be up for 12 hours, though. No, and that, and that is right. I mean, like the Indian that I picked up from uh, Music City Indian from Cam out there, I rode that back from Nashville in one day, 750 miles, and that's curvy road miles. Yeah. And that was from 10 in the morning to 11.59 p.m. on the dot. Yep. <laughs> nice. I was done. Yep. We did 13 hours of interstate up to Arkansas. Well, I drove. You, I was, I was yeah. very comfortable. I heard about your trailer queen action. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not going to say that's wrong. I mean, you're, you're yeah. full of energy. You're ready to go. You're I, hydrated. I, I, I tell you what, we rode the entire weekend yep. and wasn't sore. That trailer paid for itself that trip. Agreed. <laughs> so. Agreed. I, I don't have any problem trailer and a biker throwing it in the back of my truck. Everybody says something about it. Like, I love, uh, I rode on the way back from Nashville. I went from Nashville to Memphis to hot springs to Tallahina to Mina to Atoka mm-hmm. and that's a beautiful ride yeah especially when you start getting over towards the Arkansas side yep. yeah and I want to I was in a pitch black dark from oh Mina all the way to Atoka Ugh. on highway 8 I believe it's a that sounds terrifying really really cool looking place in the dark but I was doing like 9,500 miles an hour in the middle of nowhere yeah and I didn't have a moon it was <laughs> cloudy the whole freaking time but I really wanted to get back. Mm-hmm. But in order for me to get from, it wasn't a token, it was Stringtown on 75. So to get from my place to Stringtown to start that ride again so I could see it in daylight is two and a half hours. Mm-hmm. And a buddy of mine, Adam Garley, and I talked about making that ride. I'm like, dude, I don't want to ride two and a half hours to go ride a couple hours. Like, <laughs> I want to go up to that point. Yeah. Or maybe even just go over to, you know, Mina or wherever, you know, the Tallahina Parkway and then just put her truck in over there, get her bikes out, and then ride that yeah. around. You know, it's an awesome place. Yeah. I heard you guys spend some time there. Yeah. I, I want to take these guys through Mina and Tallinn because I grew up in Dallas. Yeah. So I've ridden up there a bunch of times. And it's, it's a blast, especially because it's Oklahoma and everyone thinks Oklahoma is just flat and boring. No, it's it's gorgeous riding up there. The roads are perfect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Once you get clean. off the, the interstates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are. It's the interstates are garbage. How incredible the roads are. Up there. Yeah. yeah. That's what we said about Arkansas, too, is it was – after being spoiled for that whole weekend, come back to Texas, we're like, oh, my God, what is this? <laughs> it's so <laughs> garbage. But, yeah, the Arkansas roads were very nice. All right, so we've talked about um, your first and most recent project. Do you have a favorite project that stands out from all the rest? Element 13. Yeah? Yeah, that's definitely a, a creative standpoint for me. Like, Was that because of the exposure it got? No. The, no? That bike got no play. Really? Oh, it got hated on so much. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really crazy because, I mean, I started with frame castings. Yeah. I have a picture of just the casting sitting on the ground. Wow. And, you know, to take a touring frame and completely cut it down to castings and start from scratch. 
And That's like, literally building a bike. <laughs> yeah, they, the um, the base frame rails are normally inch and a quarter on those bikes. On 2009 newer frames, or inch and an eighth, and I increased them to inch and a quarter because we put a 132X wedge in that bike. And it was a twin plenum motor at the time. There were only three of those known to exist. And there wasn't even a fuel map for those yet because nobody had put it on the road. Yeah. But to take something that didn't belong and then make it happen in there, it was, it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. A lot of sheet metal shaping. I mean, we built that bike to the point to where it was finished for that episode three three weeks <laughs> three weeks for that bike and then there were and the only thing that wasn't done at the three week point was the skirting next to the fenders between the bags and the fenders and around the front of the seat or the the front of the fender to the seat area Jeez. so the saddlebags the cnc ba- billet lids i don't know if you guys know about that but like the lids are cnc billet to look like corvette valve covers Wow. They weigh 13 pounds a piece. And I have my buddy Gary at Golden Boy uh, Mobility out of San Diego machine those for me. That's the guy I was wake surfing with the other day. Wow. Um, <laughs> we had a one-week conversation from the time that I said go, and he delivered them to me. Each lid's 48 hours worth of machining. Wow. <laughs> and then I had to make retainer rings that received the lids with enough lip inside geometry for the sheet metal that was going to go around it to build the bags out. And then I put... Uh, neodymium magnets on it that had elevators so that I could change the amount of uh, contact potential they had. Mm-hmm. So we had like 132, no, two, 260 pounds worth of downforce holding those lids down. And then while George was riding it after we finished that bike and we're blocking traffic, you know what, like imagine what it sounds like if you take an Alcoa semi-truck rim and throw it on the ground. Yeah. I heard that happen. And it was a bag lid that popped off because he had a pothole and it's spinning on the ground. And this car ran it over oh. and it was just <laughs> devastating. But that project was super cool because I mean, for one at that time, that was the first time I ever handmade a gas tank for a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. It was the first time I ever fully handmade from tip to tail a fender for a motorcycle. It was the first time that I'd ever fully handmade a frame for a motorcycle. It was the first time that I ever built saddlebags or any of that stuff from scratch for a motorcycle. And I mean, I designed the taillight, the foot controls in the computer, built the frame, did all the sheet metal work. You know, like there's an oil tank on the right. The tank, the gas tanks is the left is gas. Mm -hmm. The right side on the front half is oil because it's got a five quart capacity. (laughs) And then the back half of that tank is electrical. Mm. And so it's air, air ride front and rear and, um, has a high low switch. Doesn't have a horn on that one, but you can yell honk honk yeah. or whatever. But yeah, that's that that's very significant for me because to execute all those things that I'd never done before, knowing that yeah. it's just the same principles of metal shaping and fabricating and all that stuff. It's like, okay, this shape is this. And I didn't have a power hammer. All I had was an English wheel, bags, hammers, dollies, no planishing hammer. That was all handwork. All, all old school. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody was like, Oh, you guys didn't paint your bike. What a fucking cop out. I'm like, When's the last time you fucking shaped, aluminum? When's the last time you shaped metal that didn't need paint? Yeah, right. <laughs> so if you look at the gas tank on that, I took for the graphic images that are on it. I took the periodic table elements and dissected it to where it was only they're still in the correct orientation, and put a paint mask over it. And then we sanded as a bias with the Scotch Brite, iron, titanium, aluminum, and all those periodic elements yeah. on the tank. Because those are the things that help make the bike. Oh, that's awesome. It's super nerd. <laughs> I know. That's why I'm geeking out over here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So from, from your favorite bike to my favorite bike, we've, we've already talked a lot about the Dynot, but what was the inspiration behind it? Behind the Dynot? Correct. Um, was it all planned out or did you just kind of go and oh, just no. build it as you go? No, I definitely planned it out. Yeah. So, I had bought, because I tore my 2012 Road King down because I was told as part of Misfit that I should be working on my own stuff. And so I built it out as a 23-inch lay frame before any of the little wheel lay frame bikes were out because mm-hmm. I was building 30s and 32 lay frames for everybody. I was building a 23-inch lay frame for myself. It's supposed to be all choloed out and stuff, and now I'm way past caring about that. <laughs> so <laughs> I... You uh, don't say. <laughs> I had that truck that I had bought for two grand and there was a guy that needed a truck and I freaking had opportunity to get this Dyna and I was like, yeah, I need another motorcycle. Yeah. I need something to ride. Like it was driving me nuts. So I ended up with this Dyna and you know, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of issues with it. Everybody's like, Oh, Dyna wobble, Dyna suck. And I mean, I rode that thing to Sturgis the first year I had it. 
uh, two days, rode it, rode it in the hail for the first four hours on the second day because we had to leave at a certain time. But, um, man, I put like 10,000 miles on that bike <laughs> in two years. And, I mean, I work like 80-hour weeks. But because I like the Dyna so much and I wanted to do – I got I got invited to hot bike tour again. Was kind of the gig. Yeah. Um, somebody was removed from the business. We had an opportunity to present ourselves as myself, being the builder and writer for a hot bike tour that year. And um, decided that I was going to build a particular bike, and Misfit wasn't behind it. They were like, "No, nah, we're not going to build a bike for that. We're just not. We're just not going to get involved." The problem was we got invited, and they were like, "Yeah, it sounds great." So like for the first month, I was talking to all the people that I always wanted to lean on for myself for the company to build mm-hmm. a bike. And I was talking to all these vendors about what we were going to do and what I was going to do. And I'd already made all these commitments. And then Misfit just said, we're not doing it. Nope. And I was like, <laughs> fuck. I was like, so now I have to do it myself and it's just mm-hmm. going to be my bike. Man, I sold my Pullmax. I freaking did everything in my power to freaking put money into it to try to freaking make it happen. And uh, was able to pull it off. And I mean, even thankfully for... Um, you know, my ex-girlfriend, Crystal, she actually helped fund part of it, too. Like, at the very end, she gave me a couple grand to help buy the parts. Like, yeah. I, I could not be more grateful. But because she wanted – she and my friends wanted me to build something for myself. And in 25 years being in the industry – industries, mm-hmm. I've never built myself something for me. Yeah. And so it really meant a lot. But I designed that bike based on my bod- body geometry. I looked at what the 26-inch wheel – was on FLH and decided I was going to put it on the Dyna. Um, a lot of people think it's stupid. Uh, I don't care. Go fuck yourself. It's my bike. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I designed the chassis to where it's um, it's 30 degree neck. And originally the bike wasn't supposed to have a 26 on it. I was supposed to do um, 19 inch front, 18 inch rear, and inverted forks from Race Tech. Well, I couldn't afford the Race Tech front end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I was paying for it myself at that yeah. point. And you know who uh, Dale Yamada is? Mad Jap Customs. MJK? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No? Doesn't ring a bell, no. All right. Anyway, um, he had a, a FGR front end that he was selling, and it was like $12,000 or something. I was going to put it on the bike originally, and then it went from that to Race Tech, and then it went from that to, okay, let's just get freaking legends all the way around. And I love Jesse's good good buddy of mine. He support me 100% of the way on every project I'm on. Um. So I, I drew the front end, the basic necessity for the Dyna geometry. I drew my body, my pivot points, um, looked at where my body angle lean when I rode a bike, had weight on my arms and stuff like that, and how long it could sustain it and what it felt like. Rode a couple of bikes and my body's in certain positions so I could feel what kind of lift my body would have, like at certain speeds, because I knew I'd, I'd ride it on the highway a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, looked at what that angle was and built the stretch, rake, all that stuff based on that. So I designed my body and the bike completely in the computer before I ever pulled the trigger. And somewhere in like Moose Mitts or Moose Crap uh, Instagram, there's like images of the computer images. I drew everything up before I ever started. And then you That's look at awesome. the post images, there's even a chicken scratch on a piece of paper that I drew with like the seat layout and the flow of the tank and everything. And it looks exactly the same. Yeah. And like the gas tank was one of those things where I had to build a gas tank that day because <laughs> my seat guy was coming and I was behind. <laughs> And I'm just hours of sleep here and there over the course of days, as always. And uh, I Googled, or I, I, Craigslist, vintage motorcycle gas tank. And there was a dude, like, a couple miles from me that had this gas tank. And I was like, how big is it? And he's like, it's four gallons. I was like, cool, I'm come get it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't, I didn't even know if it was going to work yeah. or look cool. And I put it on the frame, and it looked great. Yeah. And it was almost the size of a soft tail tank. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, That's why I was shocked when you told me that it wasn't a Harley tank. I thought it was a Harley tank. No, the length of it worked great. The width looks nice. It keeps the bike kind of narrow at the top. Keeps my legs nice and tight without having to do knee dents like everybody mm-hmm. else. Um, and uh, I mounted the tank in a temporary way, and then we made the seat pan and everything fit it. Well, then when I went to go pour muriatic acid through the tank to clean it out, mm-hmm. it, nothing came out. Like, it wasn't dirty. It was clear. And I was like, That's weird. Because it looked nasty in there. Mm -hmm. I took a long screwdriver and stuck it in the bottom of the tank and drug it across it and pulled this huge ball of resin off. (laughs) So I'd already mounted the tank. Ah, It had to stay where it was. So I made a fixture to position the tank back on the frame and then took the tank off and cut the whole tunnel out of it 
and then I had to freaking torch roast the whole freaking inside of the tank to get all this resin out. I pulled a softball size resin out of that tank. God <laughs> damn. And then <laughs> after that, I welded it back up and it pinched the tunnel even though I made a fixture to hopefully hold it in place. So I had to redo the mounts on the frame, <laughs> hoping that it all landed back in the same place to match the seat. And then after that, modified it for the sports pump. But no, I, I designed the whole thing around that kind of vintage feel. Yeah. That's why it's got all the um, EMD parts on it that are finned. And I really love the earth tone. So I got a color palette. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to have uh, all the paint colors in front of me. So like I love Hyundai paints. They've got awesome metallics. Hmm. Um, went for brown family and went into the bronzes and picked it all out. And I actually made like this little desktop piece that's got the hardware, the powder coat, the Cerakote and the paint all on it that says moose crap that's like all layered and stuff two-sided that represents the exact color palette of the bike and i did that before i actually colored anything i was like yeah i love it it's yeah cool. that's awesome <laughs> so you you kind of uh kind of walked us through it already but your creative process do you have a specific roadmap that you follow for each project or is everything kind of different uh everything's kind of like platform identity based okay you know so it's kind of like I'm building a race bike, I'm building a street bike, I'm building a race car, I'm building a rock crawler. You know, what? what is the functionality of that and then how yeah. can I stylize it and then how can I be real tedious about the stylization of each one of those products and parts because I get so far into something it's like, oh, this voltage re regulator looks like shit right here, let's move it, where are we gonna put it? I don't know, right yeah. there, let's make that area look really cool for the voltage regulator and just put it there, how are the wires gonna exit? We're gonna make them look like this, we're gonna make sure they're loomed and covered this way and they slot into here and it still comes out and it's functional, I can service it. All that kind of stuff. So, functionality first. Yeah. But with intention for form, because everything has to work. Like everything needs to have a purpose. I'm, I'm very utilitarian and tactile. Like I like to touch stuff and feel stuff. And um, you're familiar. Yeah. But anyway, the uh, I I like how things operate, and I want them to be very ergonomic. So like the switch layout on my bike, it's all underneath my seat. And it's laid out in a pattern to where it's easy to recognize with winter gloves on, summer gloves on, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't have any kind of confusion as like my horn is my brights. My start button is really kind of in a certain space so that I know I don't ever touch it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that it's real important to look at function and then into form. And when it comes to color, it kind of happens as you begin to put things together. You kind of say, oh, I like blacks. I like blues. I like whatever. And you got to find ways to complement them. I mean, you know, like red and chrome, blue and chrome, black and black and black and black and black. <laughs> yeah. you, know? <laughs> you know, it's funny. You, you, you said race bike, you know, street bike, rock crawler, and minivan. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> but it, it shows, it, it's kind of <laughs> like really good singers, you know, like uh, Corey Taylor from Slipknot. Yeah. You yeah. hear him as Slipknot, and then you hear him. Uh, when he actually sings and it shows that range mm -hmm. uh, i can do hardcore and i can do really mellow cool stuff mm -hmm. he, he rapped on the song too yeah and it was actually pretty dope yeah. so it's it's just it's nice to see that you don't put yourself in a specific niche and just stay there you try to expand and try out new things and and just fabricate on whatever well and it's just stuff i mean like I, i'm not a guy that builds bikes i'm not a guy that builds cars i'm a guy that makes stuff yeah, yeah. like I, I do furniture and all kinds of stuff so i mean that's really a, a real big inst inspiration for me in general is just art and architecture mm -hmm. yeah. like that first and foremost i i love that i love i do a lot of general contracting so i mean i, I get into landscaping really? yeah i mean we just got done assisting on a three hundred thirty thousand dollar remodel on a friend of mine's uncle's house where we blew out part of the attic and we added a golf simulator with a wine cellar with reds and whites and a humidor and like God. a big bar and a TV <laughs> viewing area and an 18 foot spiral staircase and like travertine walkways and jeez, Wow. Well, that actually is a perfect segue to my next question is outside of, of motorcycles, what makes up most of your business? Uh, Toyota really fills my boat right now. Yeah. Not, is there anything not that you to can be too punny with the SpongeBob thing, but <laughs> 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 is there anything you can tell us about? Like what do they usually come to you with? Lots of stuff. I mean, yeah. um, over the last year, they had me do some modeling and uh, prototyping in the transportation sa or the travel safety systems, the TSS, which is the collision detection systems on the front of the grill shells for the uh, premium and standard versions of the Toyota 4Runner and the um, Tacoma. So we did some of that where we retrofit 
vehicles for them for photo realization so that they can then do marketing materials for that so that it can uh, escalate the images that they need or expedite the images they need before production. Mm. Gotcha. Okay. So, like they have us um, do those kind of like right now we're doing a, a whole, the, the, the dealer meeting is in September. And so we're on a schedule to release five vehicles right now for Toyota directly that are part of the new dealer meeting. Once those debut, it's all public information. You guys get to have it, but it's really cool. Cause like I've, yeah. I've done stuff like around Christmas, I was seeing commercials like I made that. <laughs> like that's mine. That's not real. That's fake. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, it that that's it. Um, I do have a CNC plasma table, so I do artwork and stuff like that. I do a lot of sign work for people. Yeah. Um, I am big into furniture. I don't get to do enough of it, but I'm getting ready to do a conference table. Uh, ironically, Sean, the guy that owns Complete, his father-in-law used to own a bowling alley, and I didn't know this. And mm. I had a friend of mine that was tearing a bowling alley out of his shop. And I asked him for some wood. I was like, how much is it? And it's, it's kind of expensive. Yeah. I was like, hey, man, I need this much money from you in order to make your conference room table. And he goes, that's a lot of money. I was like, no, that's just for the wood, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it for you at cost because it's bitching. Yeah. So I'm going to cut it from the the little arrows and dots. The first seven feet of the table is going to be the whole table. And then I'm going to do a border and a darker hard, hardwood around it. And I'm going to have a channel where I do LED lights and then put like an opaque white acrylic so the whole perimeter lights up and then do a quarter inch of clear across top of the whole thing because it's in a second story i can come right through the freaking floor with a plug because it's a drop acoustical ceiling on the first floor uh, okay so you got plenty of room to run electrical right through the floor and uh got to find something really neat that's bowling related for the bases and then out of the remaining 16 you know what's left of the 16 feet like nine feet i'm gonna make two tables one for his wife and one for his mother-in-law because you know it's their dad and yeah. their husband that's awesome. So I'm going to do that. That'll be fun. And then I think I'm going to keep the 16-foot piece that I have for myself. I'm just going to turn that into a single freaking buffet table for myself at some point. <laughs> it's just going to stay on the top shelf right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I love the the repurposing of, of that kind of stuff. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, the high-profile experiences that you've had within this industry, you know, getting to meet the people that you you looked up to. Is there one experience that sticks out from the rest? Yeah, I think I discussed it with you before. You did, yes. <laughs> so for me, one of the most amazing things that I got to experience is that we built a bike for Rockstar Energy Mayhem Tour, and we had corn and Finch sevenfold and Slipknot sign the bag lids and oh, stuff. Dang. And I didn't get to, like, go to that meet and greet and hang out with everybody because I wasn't part of the douchebag crew that got to be friends with everybody and, like, yeah. hey, look at me. And I was like, okay, whatever. So that's where John Oaks and I met. Really? Um, so I'm hanging out. We do the the party with all the second stage acts and all that fun stuff. And then late that night after everybody left, there everybody's like, we're going to the hotel. What are you going to do? I was like, I'm going to stay in the semi, I guess. I'm like, all right, see you later. And they disappear, like, going to eat, you know, stuck-up restaurant and freaking stuck-up hotels. It's like, okay, cool. I'm going to stay here and get drunk with my buddies. And then everybody disappeared. I'm sitting on top of the semi, and I could hear Jonathan Davis do sound checks. Mm -hmm. It was like 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night or something. Jeez. And I'm like, they go oh, hard. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah. So, I'm going to put on my nicest brand new button-up Dickies Misfit. My hair's braided down like freaking, you know, Indian chief. <clears throat> Grab my brand new Dickies short, tall black socks. A couple beers thrown in my God pocket. Damn. And I'm like... I'm gonna walk up in this bitch like I own it, <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> I did. I walked right up into the backstage area, and uh, I had the grace of meeting Fieldy a few times, and so he recognized me. Thankfully, when I walked through the back of the stage, because the security guard was staring at me like, "You ain't fucking coming in," <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but "I just didn't look at him like I was wouldn't walk right past him." He's like, "What's up, dude?" And I was like, "Holy shit, thank God!" <laughs> <laughs> so I got to. Um, he told me he's like, "We're getting ready to do a full set right now. With you know, come on up." hang out and so I was the only civilian <laughs> <laughs> to say it lightly like I, I was the only non-industry yeah. person I wasn't a stagehand I wasn't a security guard which there was only that one security guy <laughs> I wasn't any of the union wow. workers or anybody else I was the only person to watch that concert and so they did a full production full light smoke scream yell dance jump all their crap set and I was the only person there to witness it. And I stood on stage and walked around them and hung out next to their amps and like two feet from each of them as they played and did their thing. And then I had a point where I went to go walk off stage 
and I asked one of the stagehands, like, dude, can you take a panorama of me of like the emptiness of the amplifier all the way to me at the front of the stage and them playing? He goes, yeah. And Jonathan Davis looked at me and he goes, I got you. I was like, oh, what? shit. <laughs> and so I'm like standing five foot from the stage and this dude did this panorama and there's like this darkness behind where the seats end to the seats, to the empty pit to me standing in front of the stage and the whole band is full live action hair in the air. Jonathan's leaving, <laughs> leaning off the freaking stage, <laughs> screaming at me, holding his mic. And I, I'm just like, you were the only person my there. Hand, my, <laughs> my hands in my pockets. Like it doesn't matter <laughs> staring up on stage. And mind you at the time too, I got like hair down to my nipples and a goatee yeah. down to my freaking <laughs> middle of my chest. And <laughs> you know, it's like one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in my life. Like I'm blessed to be a part of, of so many things that have led me to that. Yeah. Like I get like people say, why do you stay up for three or four days and do the shit you do? Like you're killing yourself. I'm like, because I get to experience shit like that. Yeah. yeah. Like you can not, not, you can't live that. You can't buy that. No, never. Yeah. And there's a really great clip of me on discovery channel somewhere of me throwing my phone across the room mm -hmm. right after that. So your picture's gone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, no. And I remember throwing that phone across the room and we had a genuine argument, Chris and I did, and it was about how the bike was going to get built, Element 13. And um, he said, no, Moose, we need to do it this way. And I was like, this is the way it happens. This is reality and you live in a fucking dreamland. He said some shit to me and he goes, you need to get off your damn phone because that shit's not making us money. I was like, the reason why I'm on this phone is responding to people that want to do business with us and this shit fucking right here makes us money. <laughs> and that was real early social media for us. Like mm -hmm, he yeah. didn't understand that shit. And I threw my phone across the room and it went like wrapped itself around a pole mm. and I was watching it in slow-mo just zing across the room. And I was like, <laughs> dude, I have not backed up my phone. <laughs> <laughs> it was like smash. And then right after that, the crew was like, oh, can we get that again? I was like, man, I don't give a fuck. And so one of the, one of the, I said, give me your phone. One of the crew members handed me his fucking phone. Damn. And he didn't think I was going to throw it. And then Chris <laughs> and I are talking and the, the scene is me throwing it against the wall. Like we, I was still pissed. I was like, yeah, we can do that shit right fucking now. <laughs> and then Chris and I had the same fight. Like, and I meant it again. Wow. Y'all acted and, out the fight. <laughs> and, and I didn't have to act it out. I still meant every so fucking word funny. I said. And I threw the phone against this like corrugated steel wall that was in my fabrication area, and you could see it go into like forty pieces. And they cut the scene real short because the dude whose phone it was, he goes, "Motherfucker, that's my phone." <laughs> <laughs> oh. what, what did they want? It's like, like you asked me to do it. <laughs> yeah. What do you expect? Wow. <laughs> I love that story. So we're wrapping up here. Uh, this is once again, something that we have talked off mic before, but if, if someone came to you and they wanted, they said they wanted to get into fabricating, what is one piece of advice that you would give them? Find somebody you're closest to and ask them all the questions you want to ask. Be a good friend, go sweep their floors, go be someone's bitch. Like if you really want to get into fabrication, find somebody who's closest to you that's doing something well that you respect go earn their respect and go be their helper for free. Like that's the way to learn because you will return value to them by giving them any assistance that they possibly could have. And you should just be quiet and pay attention and not be bugging them and not piss them off and say, how do you do this? How do you do that? Hey, how'd you do that? Hey, this and that. Like if you're around it enough, you start to pick yeah. up on it. Mm. And makes then, total sense. then you just ask to help where you can but do the things that they don't have the time to do. Yeah. Go sweep their floors, take out their trash, organize their steel rack, freaking run errands for them, do all this shit. And you'll be around them doing the things they're doing enough. And if you're paying attention, you'll learn how to do them. And then when you begin to learn how to do them, they'll rely on you to help them. And then after you've learned to help them, they'll rely on you to do things for yourself and for them. And then you begin to get paid to do those kind of things. And maybe 10 years from there, is when you can <laughs> return the favor to somebody else. Yeah. You know, I've got a really good friend of mine, Neil Reimer. He is that guy for me. Yeah. Still to this day. Yep. Came by, sweeping the floors, had a, wanted to flat fender his Jeep. Just like knew I worked at that Jeep shop once and tried to be a buddy. And, you know, we just uh, began that relationship by him helping me out. And it's just been that way ever since. He's awesome. He's super talented doing what he's doing. Wow. That's awesome. I need to go Google 
San Antonio fabrication shops and go be a shop bitch. So I don't know. You're gonna have a real hard time finding a great one. <laughs> so, Jimmy, you're gonna be going to Dallas. I mean, it's a <laughs> hell of a commute. <laughs> um, so, right before we wrap this up, where can people find out more about you and your work? Um, my personal profile on Instagram is Moose Mitts. You can go back into the deep, dark history of that and find some of my post work. Mm-hmm. I recently, in the last year and a half, two years, established what I call Moose Craft mm-hmm. because I just wanted to create a different identity for myself so that I could isolate it. I've been using that as a hashtag for a while. So Moose.Craft on Instagram. I think M-O-O-S, it's correct? M-O-O-S yeah. dot craft. And then uh, Chris Moose on Facebook. And then I do have a website, it's moosecraft.com. Not anything going on there right now, but, you know, maybe check in later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time to design websites yeah. right now. There's there's some stuff up there like sign work and a little blog post, but I'm just – I don't have enough time to sit around and learn how to do it yet. Yep. It's a uh, lot of time. So we'll put the links to your social media th- and your website into the show notes. So, uh, Chris – truly appreciate you coming on and coming down to san antonio to be here in the studio with us it's uh well he didn't come down for us but no, i mean i came down to swim and hang out with my dad and yeah. daughter <laughs> <laughs> my dad my dad went to high school right here in san antonio hey, transparency man yeah <laughs> still <laughs> no I, I appreciate you guys having me here i mean i knew yeah. that you guys like to record on fridays yeah and yeah. i knew that approximately it was in the evening after everybody got off work and i was like i'm gonna spend the morning swimming with my dad and daughter and i'm gonna hit justin up and see if maybe i can come down and do a podcast hell yeah 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 anytime you want to come down let us know yeah absolutely no, I appreciate you having you guys and i'd love to have you guys up to uh denton to my shop maybe for a weekend oh, we'll make um, that happen yeah and I, <laughs> I can show you that road that you'll miss out on when you come up for the bring it home ride i can show you <laughs> that while you're up there and we can also work and do some fabrication together oh sweet, sweet. let's make sweet. it a, make it a plan man yeah thank you for tuning in to between two wheels podcast to see the show notes for this and all of our episodes to find links to our social media and patreon page where we are raising money for project clean slate head over to our website at www.betweentwowheels.com the two is spelled out t-w-o on behalf of justin uncle ken i am johnny roblox saying be yourself unless you're a jerk then be someone better Peace. I, 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 I.